Okay, so we'll start the recording after the main presentation, so you can feel free to ask Kevin uh, lots of crazy questions, as crazy as you like. Um, but so we, um, uh, the, um, so we'll, it's, as I said, it's um, a real pleasure to restart uh, Conscious Club today with uh, Kevin O'Neill uh, from Duke University. So Kevin is a PhD candidate in his fourth year uh, working between Felipe de Brigade and John Pearson, and he uses a mix of methods from psychology, computational modeling, and cognitive neuroscience to understand the computations underlying human causal judgment. And he's also working uh, with Dr. Paul Bellow and Will Bridewell to implement some of these ideas in the cognitive modeling framework Arcadia. Um, so it's I've seen um, a couple of Kevin's very recent papers, which are very exciting at this intersection of causation, metacognition, confidence. So lots of things that I think the Conscious Club audience are going to be very interested in. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Kevin, to tell us about disentangling confidence and causal judgment. Yeah, thanks so much, Stephen. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to present this work here. Um, so. Um, I really, I'm, I'm going to present two papers that have recently come out um, that I've been working on. And I see these two papers as kind of an interplay between two different fields. One is causal judgment, which is kind of where I'm coming from. Um, it's most of the research that I'm familiar with, but also research in metacognition. And um, the main goal of these two papers and this project in general is just to see how we can understand causal judgment using what we know about metacognition and vice versa, how we can understand metacognition um, using causal judgment as kind of a, a boundary case. Um, so to just start off, um, first, I'm gonna talk about a paper um, which focuses on just how, how are confidence and causal judgments related. And we'll see that um, this relationship between confidence and causal judgments actually creates some interesting philosophical problems that, that need to be solved. Um, on the second part of the paper, I'm gonna be talking about a model that I've been working on. And this is kind of really just a first pass model at trying to see how we can model confidence and causal judgments. Um, I think there's a ton of different directions we could take this in, but this is really just um, our, our first steps here. Um, so to start us off, I've got this example um, and this example is really just intended to give you an idea of the kind of causal judgments I'm interested in. So um, imagine you're driving to work and you're stopped at a red light. The light turns green, so you start crossing. At the same time, someone else on the cross street, they start running the red light and your cars collide and there's a fender bender and so you're late for work. Your, bo your ball sucks while you're late and so what do you say? If you're like most people, there's really just one answer to this question. You'd say, I'm late because some person ran their red light and crashed into my car. Um, and so when we answer causal questions, um, there's a long line of philosophy and psychology that points to the idea that we use counterfactuals to answer these questions. And by counterfactuals, I mean statements like this. Had they not run the red light, I would have been on time. We call this a counterfactual because the antecedent to this conditional is counter to the fact that they actually did run the red light. Um, so this is kind of what would have happened if they had not run the red light. And the idea here is if what would have happened had been, would, would have been different than what actually happened, then that cause made a difference to the effect. Um, the problem is that we can actually use this same kind of logic for all kinds of possible causes. And this leads to something called the, the selection problem in causation. Um, so you can say, maybe if I just decided not to drive through the green light, just because the light's green doesn't mean you have to drive through it. Um, and if I just decided to not drive through the green light, then the accident would have been prevented. Um, you can also say, maybe I took a different route, or maybe I decided to walk today, um, then I would have been right on time. Um, but it, you can take this kind of super far back, as basically as far back as you want. So maybe if it was... Uh, if it was a weekend instead of a weekday, I would have had nothing to been on time for, and I just would have never left my apartment. Uh, or maybe if I pursued a different career, if I went into baking, the, I started a bakery, I would have woken up super early in the morning where there's no traffic for me to get into an accident. And so you can kind of take this 
super far and it, really the imagination is your limit here. Um, and so most of the research in causal judgment has been focusing on why we point to that person running the red light when there are all of these other things that meet our kind of baseline criteria for what causes an effect. And there's this whole laundry list of things here. Um, normality, alternative causes, recency, and so on and so forth. I'm gonna focus on these first two. And by normality, what I mean is causes that are rare or morally wrong or just abnormal. So running a red light is prescriptively wrong. Um, you, can, you can point to that and say, um, you're not supposed to do that. But also it's kind of rare. People don't run red lights very often um, compared to not running them. Um, and so that's one feature of that event that actually makes that stick out. And if we have this idea now where we have a whole list of causes that could have contributed to this accident, um, but things like normality and other features tend to make certain events stand out, we end up with this issue is, what does it mean for the, red, the person running the red light to be more causal or stand out more than all of the other causes? So um, is it really the case that it's more causal or do we just point to it more often or something like that? So there are two kinds of views that have been pushed um, towards this line. So graded causation is just simply the idea that causation is a spectrum. So there's a, a literal continuum between not causal at all and fully causal. And something can be some like 50% causal or maybe just a partial cause. And there's some kind of principled way to compare causes based on their strength. Um, the non-graded causation view simply says that causation is just all or none. It, it, it's either a cause or it's not. And anything that is a cause, they're just equal. Um, they're on an equal basis. So it, it's literally just a one or zero. And you can look at these views, trace them back to philosophy. Um, so people have these debates about whether causation itself is graded or non-graded. Um, but there's also an analogous debate in psychology where people are arguing about how we mentally represent causation and whether those mental representations of causation are graded or non-graded. Um, and so when we go back um, to, to kind of simplify this, um, I'm gonna introduce this framework where I'm breaking down causation into some component pieces. Um, so causation, um, what I'm going to call causation is what philosophers talk about. So this is what causation actually is. Um, I'm not going to be talking about this very much. I have a question mark here because there's a whole lot of debate about whether this is graded and there are good reasons on both sides. Um, what I'm interested in as a psychologist and a cognitive scientist is whether people's representations of causation are graded. And then this is also up for debate because um, again, there's evidence kind of to both sides of whether people represent causation in a graded or non-graded way. I have kind of a, a dashed arrow here to represent the fact that how we represent causation may or may not actually depend on what causation really is as defined by philosophers. Um, and that, that's just an empirical question to be solved and a philosophical question once we settle on what causation actually is. Um, from here, it gets more interesting. So here we have causal judgments in, and these are just the behavioral Report. So this is someone's endorsement of a causal claim. Um, and we know that these have to be definitely graded to some extent. So there's things like behavioral noise, there's things like um, error, there's things like people have trouble comprehending questions, so, and there's anchoring effects and things like that. So there's some extent to which there needs to be some kind of noise in these judgments. Um, the question is whether this noise comes entirely from um, gradation in people's causal concepts or whether it might come from somewhere else. And the question we wanted to ask in this first paper is whether it might come from something like confidence. Um, so our idea basically is that even if someone thinks that um, a cause is totally causal, and even if they have a completely non-graded or discretized concept of causation, they might still provide graded ratings of causal judgments simply because they're more or less confident in those claims. Um, so to bring this back to our example, there's two kinds of explanations we might give for graded causal judgments. 
the causal strength explanation, which is kind of implicit in the literature, is that causal judgments are graded just because people represent causation in a graded way. Um, our alternative explanation is this confidence explanation. And this is causal judgments are graded because confidence is graded. And that, that may or may not be um, in addition to people's representations of causation being graded. And so when you get these examples, like this person running the red light is more causal than um, me running the green light, um, there are two different interpretations of what these behavioral meanings might mean. So the causal strength explanation would say that people are literally trying to convey that them running the red light somehow was more of a cause or a stronger cause than my driving through the green light. Whereas the confidence explanation would just say that people are more confident in one cause than the other. And so this first paper, again, is really we're just trying to disentangle whether gradation in people's causal judgments is due to gradation in their representations of causation or whether that can also be attributable to gradation in just their, their level of belief in causal statements. Um, so this is this first paper and um, the kinds of vin vignettes that we decided to give people are exactly this example that I gave you. So you can read through this, but it's literally directly analogous to the car accident example. So Billy and Susie are fight train conductors. They are driving across a bridge and if both of them go onto the bridge, then the bridge will collapse, but they don't know that. Um, one of them gets a red light, one of them gets a green light, but they both decide to, to drive onto the bridge and so the bridge collapses. And people are asked, to what extent did Billy running his red light cause the bridge to collapse? Um, and so we give people these kinds of vignettes and we give them a, a normal kind of behavioral rating with slider scale kind of zero to 100. To what extent did Billy running the red light cause the bridge to collapse? And then we also decide to give them a confidence rating. The interesting thing about this experiment is we decided to match the vignettes and present the, all of the vignettes twice. Um, the vignettes had kind of names that were randomly assigned. And so we were trying to minimize the extent to which participants were simply trying to replicate responses. But on the other presentation of this vignette, we gave them a discrete rating. So we gave them an option between X caused Y, it partially caused Y or did not cause Y. We decided to have a partially caused here um, because if you look at histograms, I'll show this later, but if you look at histograms of causal judgments, there often is an anchoring effect in the, the middle at 50%. Um, and so our idea here is that we wanted to see if we can look at this discrete causal judgment and confidence in that discrete judgment and see if we can fully explain the graded causal judgments. And so our idea here was if there's very little variation in the in the continuous causal judgments that's not accounted for by these two things, then uh, we can say that people's representations of causation are effectively discrete. It's just that when they rate, when they judge causation, um, those judgments are kind of um, affected by their, conf their level of confidence. Um, so to get right into it, um, we split it up by whether people rated totally caused, partially caused, or did not cause at all. Um, this is totally expected when people say that the cause is totally caused. Um, their continuous causal ratings are really high and they're kind of smushed up against the top here of the scale. And there's some trail off down to say 50%. Um, also people tend to be really confident in these statements um, where also they're almost entirely confident and there's some trail off towards 50%. Interestingly, there's also a correlation here. So um, when people were more confident about a totally causal statement, they were also more likely to give higher continuous ratings. And when they were less confident, they were more likely to give a graded rating. If we look at did not cause, we see exactly the opposite thing. So when people say X did not cause Y, um, the continuous rating that they give is is proportional to how confident they are in that statement. And similarly, when we look at partially caused, um, there's basically no effect of confidence here. So people could be um, more or less confident, but they're going to give a grading no matter what, which makes a lot of sense. Um, another interesting thing about this data is that we all saw some effects on the, the variance of causal judgments. 
So pretty much regardless of which causal rating they gave, as their confidence went up, the standard deviation uh, or the variance between participants of those judgments went down. Um, so as, as people are more confident, they tend to agree with each other more. Um, we, in a second experiment, we kind of replicated these findings, um, except we added some, some other effects in here to see whether confidence would account for the effects. So um, we're looking at the normality effects. Again, normal causes are those that happen regularly and abnormal are those that are wrong or happen very rarely. And we also decided to look at effects of the presence of alternate causes. Um, so looking here, we see that people's causal judgments decrease as there are alternate causes that could have explained the effect. And this happens to a lesser extent when the cause is abnormal. So if the cause is really rare or strange, people will say that it, it definitely caused the outcome, regardless of whether there are other things that could have explained the outcome. Um, the interesting thing is in a disjunctive scenario, these effects actually reverse, where the abnormal causes are the ones that deflate with uh, alternate ca candidate causes. And the interesting thing about this data is that um, confidence, although there were some small changes in confidence, they don't actually explain these effects, which is kind of what I think researchers in causal judgment would like to see, is that these effects are actually effects on people's concepts of causation. So people are, are genuinely thinking that some causes are more causal or less causal than other, and it's not just that they're more confident in one cause, or an, they're more confident in an abnormal cause, say, than a normal cause. Um, so to kind of wrap this paper up, we found that confidence modulates causal judgments. These two ratings are kind of deeply intertwined, where when people are less confident, they tend to give more graded and more variable ratings. When they're more confident, they tend to give less graded and less variable ratings. So they tend to agree with each other more, and they tend to give ratings that are just all the way at the end of the scale, yes or no. And still, we saw that there are some judgments that are totally graded and confident. So if we, I go back here, um, some people, there are, there are people that rate um, judgments that uh, are around 50%, but they're totally confident. So here, for instance, there's a whole lot of participants that say with two causes, um, one of those causes would be 50% causal and they're entirely confident about that. Um, and importantly, we, even though these two ratings are kind of deeply intertwined, we found that confidence doesn't explain away causal judgments. Um, and so we have this weird kind of philosophical issue where um, we found that um, people's judgments of causation are affected by confidence. Um, but, but you can actually pull this variation out and say, um, it's not just confidence that's impacting these ratings. There is actually something to, to these effects on causal judgments. Now, the second part of this work um, is, is a different paper that I recently presented at NeurIPS um, and I'm still working on. Um, but here we wanted to model cause, confidence in causal judgments. I'm gonna start by just talking about modeling causal judgments and we're gonna expand that existing model to model confidence. Um, so let's return to the, this example. Um, so we set, found when the person runs the red light and your boss asks you why you were late, you tend to say the person running the red light caused me to be late. Um, and the reason we said this is because people rely on counterfactuals because we're thinking if only they didn't run the red light, I would have been on time. And this suggests a pretty simple algorithm for modeling causal judgments which is you just mentally undo the cause. You imagine what would have happened if the cause had been absent. And then you just check what, what would have happened um, in terms of the effect. And so if, there's, if the effect would have been different in that circumstance, you would say that that cause is causal, but if the effect would have been the same anyway, you would say the event's non-causal. Um, the problem with this kind of simple algorithm is that we can't literally undo events. So there's no way to, to roll back time and then kind of force that person to not run the red light and then see what would have happened. So we have to imagine everything and we have to estimate them probabilistically. So counterfactual sampling models is the idea that 
uh, we just do this process probabilistically over a whole bunch of different samples. So maybe we'll imagine one scenario in which the person runs the red light and there's an accident. But we could have also imagined a scenario in which they run the red light and there was no accident. So maybe this time I took a different route um, or something else would have happened that the accident would have been there. Um, and we can just do this iteratively a whole bunch of times until we end up with a probability, which is just an average over those samples. And similarly, we can do this same exact process, imagining that they didn't run the red light. And so we end up with two distributions, two, two beliefs. Uh, one is the belief that the accident would have happened if they ran the red light, and the other is the belief that the accident would have happened if they didn't. And counterfactual sampling models say that if we just take these two distributions and we contrast them some way, we'll get a distribution over the causal effect of that event. Um, here I have a minus sign. Um, some of the models do propose that this contrast is a literal subtraction, but um, the models all have kind of different metrics for how this contrast should work. Um, so no matter what, you'll end up with some contrast between two of these probability distributions, which basically says that um, negative one would be the cause prevented the outcome from happening, one would be the cause um, forced it to happen or generated the effect, and then zero would be no effect. Um, but of course, people can't report this whole probability distribution. So um, these models say that in order to, to make a judgment, people just report the mean. Um, so they take the mean of this distribution, and that's their causal judgment. Um, to kind of test these ideas, um, this is an experiment from Morris et al. in 2019. He had these scenarios where, um, again, this is very, very similar to the, the, the traffic example. Um, there's this uh, character, Joe, who's playing a casino game. It's pretty boring. Um, but basically, he blindly draws two balls from two separate boxes. And the idea is that if he gets a green ball and if he gets a blue ball, then he gets a dollar. Um, and so it turns out that he draws a green ball and a blue ball, and so he gets the dollar. And we ask people, to what degree did Joe win the dollar because he drew the green ball from the left box? And uh, I'm going to call this green ball the focal cause because we're asking about the green ball. This is the one we're focusing on. And then the blue ball will be the alternate cause. Um, I have, this is the causal structure. We can manipulate whether he needs both the green ball and or just, just the green ball or the blue ball. We can manipulate the probabilities of both of those events. And we also manipulated the valence. Uh, we didn't see any valence effects, so I'm not going to talk about that, but I can, I can bring that up later in Q&A if you're interested. Um, and importantly, we measured causal judgments and confidence ratings. Um, what they found in previous research on just the causal judgments is that, again, there's normality effects. So um, the focal cause, people will judge it to be more causal when it's abnormal. So if, if we're asking someone, to what extent did you, running the red light cause the accident? Um, that's more causal than run, driving through a green light. Um, but people will also say it's more causal when the alternate cause is normal. So when there's no other explanation, then people would say that it's more causal. And again, these patterns reverse in disjunctive structures. Um, to see what counterfactual sampling models would say, again, it's the same process where you just say, let's imagine a bunch of cases in which you drew the green ball, and a bunch of cases in which he drew the red ball, and we'll contrast these probabilities somehow. And if you do this, here's what you get. So on the x-axis here, I have the probability of the focal cause. So this is the green ball. And on the y-axis is the probability of the alternate cause, which is the blue ball. And um, to a large extent, these models actually do agree with each other. Um, specifically, the crediting causality, necessity sufficiency, and the counterfactual effect size models all tend to agree with each other to a large extent. Um, these other two models are a, a little bit older, and they're not exactly intended for this kind of causal judgments that I'm asking about, um, but we wanted to test them anyway. And so it's been a hard problem, actually, in causal judgment research to, to distinguish between these models because they predict very similar effects. And they do very similarly in actually predicting causal judgments. Um, so here's what we got from this experiment. As you can see, we, we replicated both of these two effects that I just told you about. So people 
So as you go to the left, as the, as the cause that we're asking about is more and more rare, then people will judge it to be more causal. And again, as the alternate cause becomes more and more expected, then the focal cause is more causal. And if you compare this again to the model predictions, you can see that again, the models do pretty darn well in capturing these judgments. And it's kind of hard to pick out whether some models are truly better than others in certain respects. And the destructive structure, again, we found the opposite result, where there's as the cause gets, as the focal cause gets more normal, people will give higher causal ratings. And as the alternate cause gets more rare, people give higher causal judgments. Um, the models do less well in this regard. Um, but again, it's not entirely clear which of the models is kind of better in this case. Um, so what we wanted to do in the second paper is to kind of expand these models, these existing models of causal judgment and see whether confidence can help us here. Um, the idea is that if the models differ in their confidence judgments, then maybe we can use confidence to kind of pull them apart from each other. So to give you an intuition of what our model is actually doing, um, I'm just gonna ask the simple question, which is which of these judgments, or which of these beliefs would you be more confident in? And I'm gonna start off by saying, both of these beliefs have a, an estimate or a mean of zero, um, but clearly they differ to some extent. Um, this on the left, the belief in zero is a lot more concentrated. And so there's maybe some probability that the effect would have been positive or negative, but it's pretty clearly zero. Whereas on the, the right, it, the effect could have been any, basically any size or any direction, and we just don't know. Um, most people would say that they're more confident in this left belief, and the reason would be because the belief is more precise. Um, there's, less, there's less entropy or there's less of a distribution of um, what possible effects that it could have been. And so the model that we're going to be using is, uh, it's called a precision model of confidence. And um, all we're going to be doing is taking these distributions that the existing causal judgment models give us and looking at how wide they are under some metric of wide. Um, and importantly, I wanted to demonstrate this is that these beliefs can be more or less wide and that's independent from the actual causal judgment itself. So you can have a really high causal judgment that's wide or narrow. You can have a really low causal judgment that's wide or narrow and you can have a graded causal judgment that's wide or narrow. Um, and we're gonna use three or four different metrics to kind of define how narrow these distributions are. Um, it turns out for our, our stimuli of interest, the standard deviation, the variance and the entropy are all extremely similar to each other. So I'm just gonna be reporting the standard deviation. The coefficient of variation is also very similar. This is just the um, standard deviation divided by the mean. Um, and we get very similar results for that as well. Um, so again, I'm just gonna be focusing on standard deviation for today. And if you do this, if you figure out, okay, how, how wide are these distributions predicted by the models, you actually see that the models separate pretty well. Um, so these first two models, they expect effects mainly um, due to the probability of the alternate cause. And all of the other models predict some kind of nonlinear effects. Um, but importantly, the direction of those effects are different between the different models, which tells us that we can actually use these confidence judgments to pull apart models. And so if we look at people's confidence judgments in these scenarios, what we see is pretty similar actually to um, their causal judgments. And this shouldn't be terribly surprising given what I showed you before from our last experiment. Uh, we saw an abnormal inflation effect where people are more confident when the focal cause is abnormal. So they're more confident in attributing causation when someone runs a red light versus driving through a green light. And people are also more confident when alternate causes are expected. Um, if you look at the model comparisons again, most of the models don't do a super great job <laughs> in this case. Um, the, particularly the necessity sufficiency model is and the counterfactual effect size model are ones that come out as better. Um, but this alone weeds out a lot. In the disjunctive structure, 
again, we saw very similar results to the causal judgments where um, as the focal cause got more normal, people would judge it as more causal. And again, if you look at the, the model predictions, not all of the models predict these effects. And so, so to kind of summarize this, here are model correlations between um, the models predicted causal judgments and confidence and participants' ratings. And we can see that for the causal judgments, even though most of the models do pretty well in one or both of the causal structures, in terms of confidence, only one of the models predicts confidence in both causal structures. And this is the necessity sufficiency model. And so we take this as pretty strong support for this model. We don't think it necessarily rules out the other models because um, as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, this is only a first step at modeling what, how people could be making confidence ratings. And so there could be a whole lot of different other ways that people could be making confidence that would make different predictions. Um, but as a simple star, we think this is um, a good sign that confidence can help us um, sort out these models. And so to kind of wrap things up, um, first I talked about how confidence and causal judgments are related. And so there's, again, there's some interesting philosophical problems in there where um, confidence can really help us understand what causation is, how people represent causation. And um, in, indeed, I think we actually need confidence ratings in order to sort out which, which variance in the causal judgments is due to confidence and which is due to our manipulations. And in, our in the second part, uh, I proposed the model of confidence and causal judgments. We found that um, at least one iterative version of this, these models could jointly predict um, causal judgments and confidence. Um, I didn't talk about this a whole lot, but um, importantly, the, the, these models that uh, I, we came up with, they do predict a tight relationship between causal judgments and confidence. So kind of out of necessity, those two ratings should be related. Um, and so to kind of, if there's um, nothing else you take away from this talk, I kind of wanted to um, pitch the idea that metacognition can help us understand causal judgment. So if you're a causal judgment researcher, um, I think it's crucially important that we actually collect confidence ratings and we use those in understanding our causal judgments. And if you're a metacognition researcher, I think causal judgments can help us understand metacognition. Um, and the reason is because causal judgment is kind of a, a boundary case for, or, or an, a testing case for metacognition. So in things like visual perception um, or uh, value-based decision-making, we have a really, really good idea of what those judgments should look at like and how we can compare those, the, the baseline decisions to accuracy and how we can track um, the relationship between confidence and accuracy. For causal judgments, it's a whole lot more complicated because it's a whole lot more difficult to tell someone that their causal judgments are wrong. Um, and so I think this is a super interesting problem for metacognition um, and causal judgment research alike. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for having me talk here. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I'd like to thank my collaborators. So Felipe de Brigard and John Pearson are my co-advisors. Um, Paul Henne and Paul Bello are collaborators at Lake Forest College and the Naval Research Laboratory. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Kevin. That was a fantastic and super clear talk. So if we could just unmute and give uh, Kevin a round of applause. Fantastic. I'm going to stop the recording.